Hey all and welcome back to the Hellfire Comms Disney Fun, the third free. Still need to find a proper way of introducing these comms, but uh, hey, if we've gotten this far in and I haven't figured it out, I think it's a lost cause at this point. Today, we're going to be taking a look at what may very well be another lost cause. This is the <laughs> 2017 remake of Beauty and the Beast. Another entry, shall we say, into the ever-growing live-action remake genre of Disney films. So, um, I guess we should just get right into it, Richie, and then we can, like, talk yeah. about how we feel in general. Okay, guys, everything you will need to sync up our audio to your copy of the film can be found in the video description. If you're a regular, you guys should know how this works by now, so we're going to count down, and, uh, yeah, here we go, in three, two, one. You know, it's funny, I was checking Twitter and whatnot today, and someone said that there was a new Lindsay Ellis nostalgia yeah. chick uh, video. I was like, huh, okay, cool to see she's still <laughs> making videos, only to find that it's a literal thanks, I hate it, video on this very film. Yeah, <laughs> and to be honest, I haven't watched that video, but that thanks, I hate it, is sort of where my uh, opinions on this film sit. It's not awful, don't get me wrong, it's a perfectly watchable film, but for me, it is completely inferior to the original film. Like, it, the 1991 animated film is a classic, and while it was quite exciting, the prospect of them doing a live-action version. They basically made a film that is trying to recreate the magic of that original film and pretty much failing in every single manner possible. Right. I have to say, I do like how they're uh, selling the French aspect more than the original film right off the bat, because, you know, it kind of makes sense. We didn't really see many people in, like, um, wigs and poofs and whatnot. No, um, they have also, you know, fixed the slight timeline issue of, you know, the fact of uh, the uh, the prince getting turned into a beast when he's like ten. Yes, <laughs> didn't really make a lot of sense in the original film, but uh, whatever. As long as it's not one of the Beauty and the Beast like sequels or midquels or interquels, I'm kind of fine, honestly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's perfectly watchable film, and I mean, generally critics quite enjoyed it, and. Audiences seem to really like it in the grand scheme of things. I mean, it grossed over $1.2 billion worldwide, which made it the uh, highest grossing live action musical film. I don't know whether that, that's that year or ever, but still. Um, and made it the second highest grossing film of 2017, the 10th highest ever grossing film in North America, and the 13th highest grossing film of all time. Which, like, that's incredible. Um, but, I would not um, say it is necessarily deserving of those numbers, but then again, the same happened with Avatar, and that film's bloody gigantic in terms of how much it sold at the box office, but <laughs> yeah, nobody remembers Avatar. Yeah, well, we'll see about that when the next three to four films come out. We have a change already in the adaptation here. She just walks in herself and instead of just being like told to fuck off at the door. Yeah, and the prince is much more of an asshole in this version. He's just like, ha <laughs> ha, off with your petty rose. It's kind of, like, comical in a sense, really. Yeah, and I mean, I like that they do introduce this as the, the prologue. She's regenerating! Um, yes, but then uh, I look at this and just go, I miss the stained glass of the original. Mm, it was the simple touch, I think. I hope we're not going to be those types of fans during this, but hey, if, if it had to happen, at least it's only contained to one film. Yeah, and on my part, it, it's going to happen. Like, seriously. Basically, a lot of my feelings towards Beauty and the Beast 2017 is why are you not the 1991 animated film? Mm -hmm. Oh, good CGI. We'll see whether that um, stays. Okay, well, I like the transition, okay? I'm trying to give credit where credit's due here. I mean, one one bit where I will give um, the film credit is that its production design, for the most part, is gorgeous. Ah. Uh -huh. Like, some of the, like, the sets are outstanding. 
Costumes is a little bit more of a mixture. Like, I would say Cinderella had much better costume design than Beauty and the Beast. Um, like, when we eventually get to it, Belle's dress is a bit disappointing in the grand scheme of things. But there we go. Do we really need to, like, spell out the plot beats of this film? I think everyone who's, like... I, I guess going out of their way to find an audio commentary for Beauty of the Beast is already intimately aware of how Beauty and the Beast plays out. But um, do we know what, like, any... I guess the phrase is canon foreigners into this particular thing? People who weren't there in, like, the original animated film? Um... In terms of characters, yes, mean. yeah. Um, so uh, you have you've got a couple. Um, the main ones being the existence of Belle's mother. She's not actually present in the film, but she has more of a plot purpose. And then you have um, Maestro Cadenza, who is the um, husband of Madame de Garderobe. Yeah. Um, but we really should point out Emma Watson as Belle. Initially, I like as an idea, Emma Watson's Belle. Amazing, perfect fit. She's Hermione, she's Belle. Wonderful. In practice, this is Emma Watson being Emma Watson and not actually having the vocal chops to actually perform this music successfully. So she's auto-tuned to within an inch of her life and it makes it really quite painful. Well... I'm going to be honest, I've, I've brought this up before, and I really do feel like a shithead having to say this, because I ain't the picture of handsome manitude, but um, when I think Belle, I don't think Emma Watson. Doesn't Belle mean beautiful? Oh, no. I would say that Emma Watson's kind of pretty enough for the role, and like vi visually looks quite right, I feel, apart from maybe slightly bigger forehead than you would perhaps be. Wow, before. okay. Hey, I'm just going off of that doll that was base that was made off of her, where the forehead was just going off into Kingdom Come. Oh. Um, but yeah, the main issue that I have with Emma Watson's Belle is that you compare her to Paige O'Hara and Susan Egan. Who, so Paige O'Hara played Belle in the original film. Susan Egan is the one who originally portrayed her on Broadway. Compare her to those, and just does not hold a candle on either a singing or an acting front. And so uh, you just end up with a Belle who isn't quite as spectacular as she should be. And it just comes up really disappointing to me. Well, part of the reason the original Belle worked so much was because she was the prettiest girl in the village, but also the most intelligent, you know. And I don't think, again, being a shithead, I don't think Emma Watson has either of those qualities. Yeah, and it's it's frustrating because there are a lot of young actresses that I think could have done amazing things with the role, but obviously they went with the the all star cast popular thing, and it's something that I've had issues with with a lot of movie musicals in the past few years is that they do always tend to select actors based on celebrity. Um, rather than their singing capabilities. And it's just like, you're doing a musical, should be able to, you know, sing proper well. And um, it's like when they did Les Mis and they got Russell Crowe to be Javert, he just wasn't cut out for that. And it, it you can tell. I'm trying to think of a few other instances where it's just gone really t oh uh, Piers Brosnan in Mamma Mia prime example of an actor who is not a singer and it's noticeable well we'll we'll leave that for uh, another day is this is this Gaston and LeFou this is indeed Gaston and LeFou you may recognize the voice of LeFou um because LeFou is played by the amazing Josh Gad, who uh, is most well known as being the voice of Olaf Hell in yeah. Frozen. Yeah. Um, he was also, he's also been in loads of Broadway stuff. Josh Gad is amazing. I think he probably camps it up a little bit too much in uh, Beauty and the Beast here, to the point where it can be slightly painful. Um, but he does a very good job. I will say also that Luke Evans does a very good job as Gaston, and he's got an amazing voice. Yeah, these two seem fit for the role, I think. 
Yeah, I think they did a very good job with Gaston and LeFou. And I would say that when we eventually get to it, Gaston is one of the few songs which I would say is arguably on par with its original counterpart. Yeah, he's not as macho as the original Gaston, but I think it's like playing more to modern Lafario sensibilities. Yeah, and also I think it would be nigh on impossible to get anyone who is as big as the animated Gaston, because that guy was like <laughs> proper, as big as a barge, shall yes. we say. Yes, yes he was. That's paraphrasing, right? <laughs> so when did you first watch this? Was it on release? No, I uh, was very stubborn and was just like, I don't really want to watch this. Like, I don't want to go in into the cinema because everything I've seen of it m says to me I'm going to be disappointed. And so I think it was on TV, like, around Christmas one time, like, the other year. And me, my mum and my dad were just like, yeah, let's let's give it a watch. And then I sat down and was just like, yep. And I, I mean, I start, I went into it thinking I'm not going to like this, which is never a good place to start with a film, ever. Um, and I wanted to give it a chance, but yeah, just the way they did Belle also just sort of, I was just like, nope. Because one of the things that this film does, and it's not entirely noticeable, but what it does is it kind of slows down the tempo of quite a lot of the songs and adds in extra gaps into them for no good reason. So, whereas, like, the original Bell um, is quite a... It's relatively upbeat. Yeah, it's chipper, yeah. It kind of keeps going ba 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 through all the stuff and all the bits and bobs. Um, but you can notice in the live-action version, the one bit that I mostly think of is when you've got the school kids going up the stairs... Um, kind of, they sing it, and it's notably slower, but then they stop singing, and then there's a few beats before anybody starts singing again, whereas in the original it's just singing, singing, sing, and it's like that, whereas this is just like, you're kind of halting me here. It's going to happen with Be Our Guest as well, like, it pauses far too many times, I'm just like, Stop, just get on with the point. And we should mention that Richie is a musical lover, so any changes to, like, a formula will f set him frothing with rage. Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm the type of person where I'm, like, go see a show and I'm just like, yeah, the tempo of this is definitely slower than what I was expecting. But that's a, that's a general thing that happens whenever you have something that's either on Broadway or in the West End and then it goes on tour. They tend to slow it down to make it easier on the cast to perform. But it's just like, you're doing a blooming film, you've got plenty of tries at this, just go full on for it. One thing I noticed, this isn't a criticism, it's just something I noticed with the adaptation, wasn't Belle's home outside the town, like in the countryside in the original? Now it's actually yes. part of the town itself. And that's actually a big subtext difference, because having her home be outside the town, and the town thinking of her as odd kind of helped sell the idea that her and her father are outcasts, in a way. Like, they're separate from society. But here, they're just... It's just a pretty girl and a wacky dad living in the town centre, I guess. Yeah, and also, Maurice isn't actually all that crazy. Like, he's sort of an inventor, but he's not the crazy inventor that he is in the original. Which, like, so he likes to mess around with machines so you can like see him making this windmill thing which looks really lovely and um basically he does music boxes and he paints and stuff. Yeah. Which doesn't really pull him put him across as being so incredibly odd that everyone's just like, yeah, they're a weird ass family. And that sort of pulled it down. But that said, I think Kevin Klein does a really, really good job as Maurice. Yeah. And I think he he's definitely one of the actors who got a lot of praise for his portrayal of the role. Okay, yeah. Got it the first time. <laughs> Damn, that's nice. It's really lovely. They don't seem, like, too poor at this point in time, if they can afford a house, like, smack dab in the middle of the sea. 
Well, I don't think they've ever been exactly poor. I mean, even in the original animated version, I don't think they were poor. Um, it was just that, you know, they, they lived outside and they were uh, slightly slightly odd. Mm, yeah, probably a little bit of a uh, spot check error on my part, though. A little bit. But then, to be fair, you don't always watch anime like Beauty and the Beast every year. I... I I'm, I say that as if I do that, I don't. Um, but there are certain bits and pieces of stories that sometimes, as we remember them, we create extra bits and bobs to them that aren't necessarily true. It's how memories work. Because when you replay a memory, you're effectively replacing it with the memory of the memory. So as you get older, the memories that you've got are kind of subtly changing as you go because you're just remembering the vision of that memory, and it just keeps going like that. On the plus side, though, every memory of me losing an argument, I've somehow started winning in those memories, so... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, Belle's done a very clever thing here, so she can read. She's uh, basically made a washing machine. Washing machine? In these days? Witchcraft? I mean, no, it's it's despicable. I mean, like, what women do that? Like, seriously. And also, she's teaching her younger to read. Who teaches girls to read? Like, seriously. Well, I'm sorry, sir. She wanted to read. No, only boys may learn the education. So who's the schoolmaster then, mate? Uh, he's just the schoolmaster, nobody particularly important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I do like that joke. That's that's a that's a pretty good joke. I think that is in the original film as well, but I I do think it's pulled off very well here. There's something similar, I definitely remember, yeah. Uh, what else has Luke Evans been in? Because I've definitely seen him in films before. You will have done, yes. Let me uh, get up his... Uh... So, the one that you're most likely remembering him from is that he is Bard in the Hobbit trilogy. Yes, yeah. Um. So, I mean, I think he did a really good job in those. He was great. He has also been in various other things, but I would say that um, Bard is probably his biggest role. You've also got um, Owen Shaw in the Furious series, which I believe he started in Fast and Furious 6. So he's not been in it that long, but still. Um, and then he was also in Dracula Untold as Dracula. There was a big thing about it when it came out, but then I think it sort of disappeared with a bit of a whimper. Well, yeah. Um, and then he was also on in The Alienist as John Moore, which I believe is on Netflix. So he's been in quite a few things, and uh, he's he's pretty awesome in the grand scheme of things. Oh no, goodbye. I'm never going to marry you, Gaston. I'm sorry. Slowly, quietly, short. It's just like, original Belle was just like, <laughs> out the door, shut the door, no. Yeah, she was quite fierce, actually, was original Belle. Yeah. And also, we're about to get another example of um, Emma Watson's inability to sing the score. Jesus, Richie, come on. I'm sorry, she's going into... Bell Encore, which in the original is sort of this big, sweeping, amazing moment. And what this is going to do is it's going to get to here, it's camera's pretty much going to stay on her, and she's not actually going to be able to belt that loud. Oh yeah, a little bit flat. I don't know why I'm criticising someone else's singing, like I can't even hold a note, but I can compare two different versions of a song. Well, should have chosen your life choices a bit more carefully, shouldn't you, Bill? Yeah. 
I think what annoys me is with that particular rendition is just that I quite like Bell Reprise. And then it's just like, uh, oh. Just, 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 it just ends. And the original is just quite a powerful piece. It's just magic. It's fine. Yeah, it's all good. <laughs> uh, some byproducts of the Enchanted Castle and the Magical Beast. Now let us follow the magic trail. I will say, at least um, this Maurice is not as idiotic as um, animated Maurice. Because <laughs> animated Maurice was just like, lovely path that way. Dark, scary path that way. At least this one's just like, oh god, there's a burning tree. I kind of have to go this way. I don't have a choice. Okay, I was wondering when the snow would kick in. Yeah, so it's coming in right now. And here are the wolves. I think this is the second film we've watched thus far where we have actually gone into the woods. Yeah! Well, Into the Woods in this sort of fashion, yes. Because um, I'm trying to think. I think live-action Cinderella did have a little bit. No, live-action Cinderella had the woods in them as well. There you go. Because um, uh, when Cinderella leaves the house in frustration and when she first bumps into Kit, that's in the forest, into the woods. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any others. Not that I can think of at the minute, but hey... Wee Philippe is best horse. Was he a white horse in the original? Um, I don't think he was necessarily as white. I believe he was sort of. I'm actually just getting the no. He was he was brown horse in the original. He was brown. He had a, a white um white streak down his uh, nose. Okay, those wolves sound like lions, by the way. <laughs> they they probably are lion sounds rather than, you know, natural wolf sounds. Foley artists do some weird things with their um, creating sounds for things. <laughs> yeah, like when you kill a wolf, it's just a celery stick being broken in half. Exactly, yeah. So did the magic change the castle as well, or was it always this funky looking? Um, it was always this funky looking, it just, it looked nicer. Well, actually, I think it has also darkened it considerably, if I recall correctly. I'm trying to remember what happens at the end of the film in terms of how it transforms, and my memory's just going, it's been far too long since I've watched this film that I didn't really that enjoy, so I don't remember all the details. <laughs> Uh, in out the cold. I guess that's Maurice's journey over, or has it barely begun? Well, you know he's a, he's, a, he's about to get locked away soon. So <sighs> uh, Richie, spoilers! It's a remake of a film from nineteen ninety one, based on a like Grimm's fairy tale. Yeah, like the ship has sailed <laughs> in terms of Beauty and the Beast's plot. Nice set design. Lovely set design questionable character design on um, the uh, moving furniture. It's got the same problem that Michael Bay's Transformers movies had. They tried to make it too ornate. Yeah, and what's frustrating is that it works in the sense of this context because you're dealing with um, you're dealing with France and really they went for that kind of overly Baroque style of architecture and um, all of the things were quite baroque um, but in comparison to the obviously the originals what they've used here doesn't emote quite so well and because it doesn't emote so well you kind of end up with all of the household furniture not 
being quite as endearing. Yeah, a bit more creepy, yeah. Yeah, there's not quite as much joy coming out of them as in the original animated version. And that's frustrating because a lot of them do do a very good job. Although you do have Ewan McGregor's questionable French accent. Although I would say that it's questionable because they told him that he shouldn't roll his R's. Huh. Why? Because they didn't want it to sound too much like the original Lumiere. Are you fucking kidding me? Nope. That is precisely the reason. So Ewan McGregor ends up sounding slightly Mexican rather than French. Despite the fact that his, um, I believe now ex-wife, I want to say. Yes, um, I believe his ex-wife um, was French or spoke a lot of French. So it's just like, uh, hmm. Mm, yeah, let's leave that one there. We're not going into politics on this movie commentary. Definitely not. Um, I will say that um, Ian McKellen does an amazing job as Cogworth. Like, it's Ian McKellen, of course he is. Um, you've got Emma Thompson as Mrs. Potts. Beautiful. Who is delightful, but I don't know why they told her to do an accent. Because basically they've got her to try and do this Cockney accent, and it's kind of... It's just like, j just you should have just used Emma Thompson's normal accent. It, it's, it's wonderful enough, and I think it would have worked. Fair question, why didn't they just get Angela Lansbury back? Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> My guess is because she's, she is not young anymore. And, I mean, yeah, she is this year 92. No, well, she's 92 at the minute. She turns 93 this year. Which is, that, that, I mean, that's insane for any actor or actress um, in terms of still working. And I mean, Angela Lansbury is still working. Um, but I think the other... The thing that they wanted was that they wanted to be different from the original film, but then they wanted to be a faithful recreation of it and didn't quite know where to sit. Yeah, that's always my problem with remakes. Either keep it almost 100%, or don't introduce any new changes, or do, or do your own thing, I should say, yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's one of the reasons why I really like the live-action Cinderella, because it says, we love and appreciate what the original did, but we're going to do our own thing with this, paying homage to that original, but doing our own thing, and it works because of it. What Beauty and the Beast does is that it wants to be a faithful recreation of the original, but it wants to try and make it better by adding in more things, by adding in more plot, by fixing things. And it's just like, as Cogsworth's terrible joke is, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it. Hey, that's a classic, actually. Exactly. Um, and the, the, the thing that I also find frustrating is that there is a way that you could have done a faithful recreation of Beating the Beast while still making it different, Use the bloody Broadway version as your base. Which was actually the original plan, I believe, for the film. So they were just going to do a live-action version of the Broadway show with all of its extra songs and so on and so forth. And I think that that would have been arguably a much more effective um, narrative route to take than what we ultimately get here. I'm assuming there's a lot of CGI and like matte backgrounds going on here, otherwise this is a very impressive set. Um, I think it's a mixture of things. If there's one thing that I think most films have gotten down right now, it's backgrounds that are CGI that you don't necessarily realise are CGI. Because, like, so many films do it these days where you get backgrounds and you're just like, that looks, that, that looks real, I accept that is real. And then you look at the CGI and you're just like, wait, that entire house and garden was just completely made out of CGI. Wow. Um, that, that, that's just the way it goes. But yes, we're, we're about to get our first proper look at the beast. Oh, he cometh. Oh, 
I gotta say, in the original, it was kind of pitch black in these dungeons. So she kind of had a reason not to be able to see him and ask him to come into the light. You could tell from his silhouette that he's got horns and shit. Yeah. And uh, even at this point, it's just like, yeah, we, we can quite we can see that he's definitely not humanoid. Well, he's humanoid, but not human at present. Surprise. That's a beast. <laughs> kind of just looks like a goat man, honestly. Yeah, there were a lot of people going, I don't know how I feel about the beast's design. Because, like, some of them are just like, oh god, they've made, made the beast hot. That was some people's reactions. Other people's was, um... I actually preferred Animated Beast because he was hotter. And yeah, there was a whole thing about how hot the Beast was. I remember that being a discussion topic <laughs> on the internet at the time. <laughs> I'm sort of... have mixed feelings about this design of the Beast. Like, it looks decent enough, but part of me feels like maybe they should have made him look a little bit more beastly. Maybe a little bit less uncanny. Like, is the face CGI? Yeah. I mean, obviously, it's it's based on the actual actor's face, um, which is Dan Stevens, who, I will say, I think he does a really good job. Seems fine so far, yeah. Like, of the two leads, I would say he's my favourite. Most people will recognise Dan Stevens from um, as being Matthew Crawley in Downton Abbey. It's more the design choices, I think, that screwed him over. Um, but there's <laughs> some hilarious B-roll footage um, of him being the Beast because he's in this hilarious motion capture suit, like on the like bouncy stilts, um, it's sort of like it's all bulked out, and uh, that's what he wore whilst he was filming, so that everyone had the right eye lines and. Um, so that they could just replace him with the CGI beast. And so you've got the entire dance sequence um, with Dan Stevens in that outfit, and it's hilarious. I'm doing a French accent, don't you know? <laughs> it, it, yeah, it's basically your David Cage accent, really. Why doesn't Belle have a French accent? Like, I get it for the original. They weren't trying to, like, go for a completely accurate thing, but you'd think here they kind of would. You'd think that, but no. That's not one of the things they decided needed fixing. One of the things that I... And I know quite a few people were just like... <gasps> about is that... Um, in the, the sequence where Belle gets trapped away, um, there's a little bit in the score which is taken from what is definitely one of the best songs in the best new songs in the Broadway adaptation of the show, which is called Home, which is like a seriously beautiful song. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd recommend everybody listen to it because it, it's gorgeous. And it sort of comes at this moment in the show. And it's like one of those things where you just go, oh my god, that is beautiful. It's the, the, They teased it there, but didn't use it. It's just like, you monsters. Part of me thinks that the reason that, that is is because um, they knew that Emma Watson would not be able to sing it. <laughs> wow, Richie, Jesus. <laughs> but seriously... She would not be able to sing that successfully. It's it's quite a difficult song to sing. Also, modest. Look at this place; it's gorgeous. Wow, yeah, that's that's decadent, really. Are these like branches tinged with gold? Maybe gold dust? Yeah, I believe so. It's bigger than my fucking house, mate. It looks bigger than mine. Yeah, probably need to do some dusting in there. That's a very different design to the original Feather Duster. 
Yes, Plumette is uh, very, very different um, to the original. Um, I mean, I believe that technically in the original she was called Babette. I think so, yeah. Um, but yeah, I think because, you know, she was very much based off of the sexy French maid in the original, they decided, yeah, that's not quite so appropriate anymore. So they decided to change her design to a swan shaped feather duster and call her Plumette. I see. It works. Um, she's voiced by Gugu Mubatha Raw, who has done some great things. I mean, you'd probably recognise her as being Tish Jones, the sister of Martha Jones in Doctor Who. Oh, okay. Um, she has also been in Black Mirror as a character called Kelly. Um, she, uh, I believe. Oh yeah, in um, so Black Mirror, it was the San Junipero episode, which is most people's, I think, favourite of that particular series. Um, she's also Ava Hamilton in The Clip of Who Paradox and uh, Dr. Kate Murray in A Wrinkle in Time. So she's she's doing some pretty good stuff as of late. Richie, what the fuck is going on? Um, Madame de Garderobe is what's going on. <laughs> so yeah, Madame de Garderobe is obviously the wardrobe. She's a lot crazier than the original iteration. <laughs> like the original iteration was completely nuts, but uh, Madame de Garderobe is in this version even more crazy. Um, she's voiced by Audra McDonald, who is well known for being in musicals and operas and so on and so forth. She's she's got an amazing voice has Audra McDonald. Oh, I think we're getting to that scene, Rich. We are indeed getting to that scene, which I have to I do find to be really quite fun. Um what one thing to pay attention to is um listen to the changed refrains that they use for Gaston, because they're pretty much all different to uh, the original, but it just kind of opens up how many options you have with this song. Mm -hmm. Also be prepared for ultra-incredibly camp Josh Gad, because he's going to go full-on ham during this song. Well, I mean, he kind of was camp in the original as well. I mean, he was, but they basically went with the, uh, this is Disney's first gay character, um, which is mm, debatable, but still. I'm glad that they did pay more attention to the incredibly gay undertext and undertones of uh, LeFou and Gaston's relationship. It's subtext, Richie. I'm not the learned one here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just slightly... Um, My brain can't even work properly. I was, I was trying to find a word there. Just like Gaston, Gaston LeFou was there. Oh my god. Just like... This song's just driving me nuts. <laughs> Enough of this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I like these two. They're probably the best part of the film so far. Oh, definitely. Like, I think Luke Evans and Josh Gads, LeFou and Gaston are definitely the highlights of the film. Which part of me kind of looks at that and just goes, um, I think you kind of messed up your, uh, your viewpoint when uh, I'm rooting for Gaston and LeFou. <laughs> Nice. I'm glad they kept that line in because that's a great one. <laughs> Help me get large, yeah. <laughs> now that is a note. <laughs> Oh, 
And now, for some reason, we're getting a random dance sequence, because why the hell not? Well, you got a movie to spread out, I suppose. Very true. <laughs> but to be fair, I'm, I'm not too overly bothered by that. It's a, it's a fun little dance sequence. And it just makes um, this song last longer, and I'm totally down with that, too. I kind of really dig um, Gaston's costume design in this film, because it keeps the original colour scheme, but it makes it like more period-friendly. Yeah, and also it makes it less um, creepy. Yeah. Which, I mean, I suppose you sort of do want it to be a bit creepy, but he actually looks like the guy that all of the women in this town would fancy and all of the guys would want to be, rather than everyone looking at him going, yeah, no, I'm actually kind of slightly terrified of you because you've got muscles coming out from God knows where. <laughs> Love that one too. <laughs> Yeah, this is a pretty good song. Probably the best one in the film so far. Oh, definitely. Although, to be fair, there's only been, like, two or three. <laughs> well, you've had Bell, Bell Reprise, and... God, this one has been another one. Well, if there was, I've already forgotten it, so this one's the winner. Yeah, basically. <laughs> there we go, we all finished where we started, except I'm now wearing a coat. <laughs> <laughs> and that's as far as you're going to get in a Disney film No, they are, they are going to go a little bit further Right at the end of the film um, For the first openly gay moment in a Disney film Which is like a millisecond of suggestiveness And that's about it Maurice was in here last night raving as usual. I've watched way too many YouTube poops. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, at least he does sound completely crazy here. And also it does make a lot more sense, because right at the beginning they did explain that when the Enchantress cast her spell, um, she removed the memory of the castle and its inhabitants from everyone in the village. Was that in the original? Um, so it sort of was there, but it was never explicit, and so it was actually kind of confusing, because it was just like, so the castle's, like, just down the road, nobody knows it exists, nobody remembers that there was a prince there, it was never actually explained. Whereas they do actually decide to explain it here, which... Is a touch that I do appreciate because I think that it is necessary to fix that particular plot hole. Can't really go wrong with uh, Chip and Mrs. Potts, really. You can't really, no. Although I know a lot of people were not necessarily best pleased with the designs once again. I thought that I well, I think we're in the present, Tom. Stay in the present. I think they look fine. So I think they do look fine. Yeah, I think I think it's the fact that they are kind of full on. Uh, French China type designs, and everyone was more expecting like proper British um, teapot designs, something much more akin to the originals. And that sort of it's that disconnect of people were expecting stuff closer to the originals and didn't get it, but then the film is trying to be close to the originals but not, and you end up in that mess. He still sounds vaguely humanish. He's not really putting enough gruffness in his voice. Yeah. Which. I know it's sort of. is one of the other things that I think people are just like. Mm, he doesn't necessarily sound quite so uh, beastly as he perhaps should. Like, um. That lad delivery wasn't very good. It was like, you should join me for dinner. That's not a request! Yeah. Um. 
I mean, obviously, Robbie Benton, who did The Beast in the original, like, did it perfectly. He had that great Beast voice that just worked. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, it's a pretty terrifying smile. Okay, that's that's pretty funny. <laughs> it's why I say that I do think that Dan Stevens is definitely the stronger of the two main leads. Yeah, he's fine so far. Like, he, he gives the Beast enough kind of... There's enough anger there, but there's enough sort of fun kind of childishness in there as well. There's that innocence as well. And I think he he pulls off the um, that immaturity of the beast, perhaps more successfully than Robbie Benson did. <laughs> nicely done, Cogsworth. Nicely done. <laughs> Cogsworth was nowhere near that proactive in the original. No, he he definitely was not. But then I suppose you've got to give Ian McKellen a bit more to work with, haven't you? I don't recall the castle being this well lit either, but that's just nitpicking. Yeah, that that one is nitpicking. I mean, it's coming from me, who is picking the film to shreds. <laughs> the lighting is not one of the things that I uh, chose to be one of the hills that I would die on. <laughs> well, it was only an observation on my part. <laughs> Well, tick tock beast. Yeah, you're uh you've only got like an hour and a half, maybe before that thing goes. So uh but this is another thing that the uh this version adds is that as the paddle falls, the castle begins to collapse around them as well. I kinda like that actually. And the other bit is that the um all of the household furniture they slowly but surely become more and more inanimate. That's also pretty good. It's it's a it's a cool effect, and I think it is also it adds a bit more um, tension to wanting Bell and Beast to get together because it's even further. So, like in the original, obviously there was the you felt bad for all of the um, the servants, but you thought, well, they're managing to live just okay as they are. Um, whereas here you're just like, well, actually, no, if you don't get together, then they lose their consciousness and everything that they ever were, and that's a terrifying thought process. So there, there is the age-old question of, what's the deal with Chip's chip? Does yes. he have actual brain damage? What's going on? God only knows... It was never answered in the original. It is never answered here. Um, although I think you can kind of tell that um, he is... He probably got chipped at some point during this, because, uh, like, seriously, he's incredibly reckless. Mm-hmm. Well, thank God they all get healed at the end, then. I know. Um, but I th part of me suspects that the chip is more a chip in his teeth that he ends up with than, you know, brain damage, even though you'd expect it's going to be brain damage because of where the uh, chip, chip actually is. I think it's more chipped tooth is uh, what they were going for in the original. I'm trying to think back, and I think in his original design, yeah, he has a chipped tooth, but um, as I said, it's been a long time since I, uh, I've watched the original. Okay, well, stop rumbling then, Rich. Oh no, please tell me they're not actually going to sing Human again. They're not going to sing Human again, Oh, thank Jesus. Oh, no, no, fortunately, that song is Garbo. Oh no, it's fun. It's more fun, I'd say, in the original Broadway than it is in the um, 
version that they added in to the special edition of the animated version, but still. We are about to go in to be our guest. Lovely, lovely. I'm ready to judge. I'm cynical at peak. <laughs> Don't forget, there is canonically at this point in time an evil, malevolent, gay organ somewhere in the castle, voiced by Tim Curry. <laughs> um, I think that's sort of what uh, Maestro Cadenza is, but, you know, not evil and uh, not gay. And not Kim Tim Curry, so... And not Tim Curry. But he is voiced by Stanley Tucci, so uh, that works out quite nicely. There we go. Time for dinner and a show. Indeed. Cool and practical. All right, there we go. <clears throat> Indeed. Yeah, it is quite slower than the original. It is, because the original is just like... It it's like it feels like double the pace of this. I'm just like, oh, just just I want to wind it up a little bit. It's just like, come on, get going, get going. Because it did slow down at one point, but that was the breakdown. Yeah, that was the um, ten years we've been rusting, needing so much more than dusting. It does go through that, but it's just like, come on, up you go. And also the original didn't have all these extra little flourishes in the middle, because it didn't need them. Colour's nice, I suppose. Colour's nice, and it's, it's well animated, don't get me wrong. And I do like the whole choreography of the sequence. It, it's pretty impressive. I think it's, it's just one of the things where you look at it and you just go, I can see what you're doing, but it's not as good as what you're trying to ape. And that's where you end up with the problem. Yeah, definitely not sung as well as in the original. The frustrating thing is, is that Ewan McGregor is an amazing singer. Like, um, if you've seen his performance in uh, Moulin Rouge, like, he's amazing. He can sing a house down. But it's, it's the accent. It is, yeah, it's hampering him. Yeah. And really, it hampers him throughout the entire film, because it's just like... I think if he'd been able to go uh, full French, he would have been better. Because he's, you, you can tell he's sort of having to think about his accent as he's performing it. And when you're having to think about your voice as you're performing, you're kind of screwing everything over a little bit. She's fine, as much as parts. Yeah, but once again, the accent. Like, Emma Thompson... Amazing in musicals. Like, I mean, she um, did Mrs. Lovett in uh, a production of Sweeney Todd, which Angela Lansbury, I believe, actually um, originated, which is quite a nice little uh, touch. And while she did do some accenty stuff in terms of going a little bit more cockney, that role was sort of more intended for it, I feel. Whereas I think that Mrs. Potts would have worked out more effective, shall we say. This is completely new, yeah. Oh yeah, this bit's just completely new. However, I will say that this is quite impressive in terms of the visual style. Uh, visually, I'm not bored by it, so don't think I'm like going, air. it's not exactly the same as the original, ergo shit. It's, no, it's got its own merits for sure. Yeah, it's, like, visually, 
brilliant. It's just the m musical side of things that's what lets it down, I would say. Because if you upped the tempo of it all, and all of this moved faster, it would just be, I think, more impressive in the grand scheme of things. Like, try and find this on YouTube and put it at, like, twice the speed. Yeah, I, I think that, that would definitely help it a lot. Or 1.5, I think, would do it right. Has she even eaten anything yet? I don't think she has, but then again, to be fair, I don't think she's in the original either. I think she got, like, maybe a, a, a slight dollop of the grey stuff, and that's about it. A decent sequence, but um, unfortunately the slow tempo of the song does kind of dull it a bit. Yeah, it, it, it's once again, it's one of those things where I'm going, I want to like you, Live Action Beauty and the Beast, but you're killing me. It's one of the things that does make me, like, really worried for the live action Aladdin. Because, obviously, this is the first instance where Disney did a full on live action remake of a musical. Because, obviously, while Cinderella originally was a musical, the live action version was not. And the same with Maleficent. Sleeping Beauty was a musical, Maleficent categorically not. Um,. Uh, so this was the first time that they'd really done the remake a musical type thing. And it, for me, anyway, it, it's a disappointment, which then does make me concerned for Aladdin, Lion King, etc. Because those were also really amazing in their original forms. And while there's potential, I'd say the one thing that Aladdin could do to get me on side is reintroducing Proud of Your Boy into the score. Because that is just such a beautiful song by um, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman. Like, it's gorgeous. That's a Broadway exclusive, I'm assuming. Well, actually, no. It was originally going to be in the original film. Um, it was going to be, I think, right towards the start of the film... Because in the original script, Aladdin's mother was present. And so it's all to do with that. Um, and it, I think it was a very personal song to Howard Ashman, who I believe also did the lyrics to the songs in Beauty and the Beast. And so because it's kind of such a beautiful song and it was so important to Howard Ashman, um, when they did the Broadway version of Aladdin, they made sure to get it back in there. And actually gave it two reprises throughout, all of which are beautiful. And so it's just like, that better make it in there. Otherwise, I think a lot of people will be very furious. Yeah. Lion King also concerns me, you know, because they've taken out Scar's villain song, Be Prepared. Oh, God. Have they even, like, replaced it with anything? Well, I think basically what they're doing is they've gotten rid of that, largely so that they can give Beyonce more to do as Nala. And that's just like, <sighs> uh, no, that's not a good idea. I'm well past the idea of having, like, celebrity push pieces. It's just like, go for the celebrity when it works, when they can actually do what you're expecting them to do. Put Howard, Jack Howard Jackman, Hugh Jackman, into movie musicals because he can do it. And he's amazing and he's got the name. Great. Um, at this point, I'd say Meryl Streep, she's got a pretty damn good pair of lungs on her. Put her into a movie musical because she can do it. And while I know that Beyonce can sing, and she can act because she was um, in Dreamgirls, it's kind of just like, but... Do you really need to? But, I mean, I'm, we'll see what happens with those ones, but I am concerned, shall we say, about the uh, future live-action adaptations. I mean, also, you know, the whole thing with Mulan completely getting rid of all the music and then cancelling out, well, getting rid of Lee Shang to replace him with somebody else. Yeah, someone who wasn't even the original tale, apparently. Yeah, it's just like, um, yeah, you kind of, you kind of killing this as an idea for me. So you are kind of lessening my excitement. Can I just get, you know, Wreck It Ralph two, Frozen two, 
um, just the animated films because I feel like I'm going to be much more happy with those at the end of the day. <laughs> Man, even Wreck It Ralph two is kind of not doing it for me, honestly. I'm I'm still hyped for it, but it does feel like they have diluted what made the original special a little bit. But then, to be fair, and it's something that I will say of quite a few of the recent Disney films, is that I don't think that their trailers have been necessarily a good indicator of their final quality. Mm -hmm. Because, like, if you look at like the trailers for Big Hero 6 and stuff, I don't think they showed that it was actually quite a good movie. Same with Zootropolis slash Zootopia. I don't think the trailers did the final product um, enough justice no, not in terms really. of showing how actually worthwhile it was. It's probably the same with Coco as well. Like, the trailers just didn't sell it. Actually, yeah, I totally agree with that. I wasn't sold from Coco at all after seeing the trailer. Yeah, but then you actually sit down and watch the film, you're actually just like, okay, no, this is actually really good. There are issues, don't get me wrong, same with most films that you watch. You go in, and there are things that you really like, there are things that you really don't like, things that you're a bit ambivalent towards. But in the grand scheme of things, for the most part, Disney and Pixar, as of late, are generally always on the, you come out of it and thinking, I've had a good time. Whether it's an excellent film or not. Um, but generally they do err more on the side of excellent films. But there we go. I, I don't recall. Did Gaston visit the castle this early in the movie, in the original? He did not, no. Um, Gaston sort of doesn't... He doesn't really have much to do in the original film. Um, he's just sort of, you know... How do you read this? There aren't any pictures in the opening. Um, then he has uh, no one. Um, then crazy old Maurice comes in. Then he doesn't really do a whole lot until he's just like, I've got a plan on how to deal with crazy old Maurice. Let's lock him up and then, you know, Belle will have to come back to rescue him. Um, and then you pretty much go into the end, and that that that's it. And this is also quite a fun thing of um, Gaston has anger management issues, which we all know. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite a fun little addition. I think it kind of works as well because the original was kind of meat-headed, but maybe this is a bit more dangerous. Yes, I agree. It's that whole thing of. Um, you don't know necessarily what he could do at a moment's notice. i got to say, I'm appreciating Olaf more with each passing year. I mean, I, I loved Olaf anyway, so um, I'm, I'm just like, yes, go Olaf! <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you expecting from Frozen 2, mate? I'm not even sure where they could go. I have absolutely no idea. All I hope is that it's not shit. Well, high hopes indeed from the <laughs> Disney Meister. <laughs> yeah, like, I, as long as they have a song that is, like, a, a good anthem in it, I'll be happy. Um, and I will say that I think that in the grand scheme of things, the Lopez is in with a good shout, because the stuff that they added into the Broadway version of Frozen are generally all pretty, pretty damn good. I particularly like Monster. That's a that's a highlight in the Broadway soundtrack. Who sings that, mate? Um, Elsa. Okay. So basically, what they did with Elsa is that they uh, gave her sort of three big numbers. So you have Dangerous to Dream, which comes, I think, I think it's just before the coronation. Then you have Let It Go, which is the Act 1 closer. Mm -hmm. And then they have Monster, which is when uh, Hans and everyone are storming the castle. And so you sort of have this shift from uh, reserved, terrified young woman to the Let It Go of the delightful uh, exploring her powers to then monster where it, it kind of turns back on itself into terrified but 
really powerful. And it's sort of effectively like a villain song, but it's that whole questioning herself and adds in sort of those some more difficult questions um, of questioning, should I kill the monster? Um, like, she's the monster, should she kill herself effectively? Yeah, I got that, Richard. Yeah. Which is, it's a powerful thing. And um, so it's, it's quite a nice arc for Elsa. And this is a new song that was added in to uh, the uh, remake. Days in the Summer, I believe it's called, which, um, rather frustratingly, there was actually a more extended version of this song, which ha- which gave it more meaning, because um, it's the song that Beast's mother sang to him throughout his childhood. And I think, it, from what I can gather, they did release a deleted scene of it, and it was really um, quite beautiful, and so it made more sense. But I don't think that it's quite as good as any of the songs that were added to the Broadway version. Mm. I think there's like a um, a danger of adding in new songs to like established properties or remakes, and that you, there's like a certain portion of the audience who are just going to see how things were adapted. And if there's like anything new that doesn't quite register with their memories or click, you run the risk of them being turned off. Exactly, it's. So it's something that a lot of movie musicals do if they're adapted from the stage, because they, or if it's a remake of an older film, because most of them want to go for that best original song, Oscar. That's what they aim for. So they throw a new song in with the intent of trying to go for that. This particular song isn't that one. Um, the Oscar bait one is Evermore, which is sung by the Beast later on, which I'd say is a pretty decent song. But I would say that, really, if you placed this song with Home and Evermore with If I Can't Love Her, you'd be much more successful, I feel. Because they are more powerful songs and work really quite wonderfully. This just sounds like any musical piece to me. I'm not really moved by it. Yeah. It, it's that thing that quite often when you come back and add in songs to things, they don't. You can tell that they don't fit as well, even if they're done by the original composers. So, I mean, Alan Menken did come back to do the music for this remake but it doesn't quite fit in quite as well as anything that he added in for the Broadway version which it it sucks hmm Yep, it's wilting at an alarming speed right now. Yeah, but hey, you know, at least it's closer to him than it was, because otherwise, you know, he wouldn't be able to see that, you know, he's got not got much time left. And yeah, just because we kind of glossed over her a lot right towards the beginning. Um, This is Agath, or Agatha, or whatever, um, who's an impoverished hermit, and sort of everyone sees her as being a witch, and sort of they're terrified of her. Um, She's a a very important character, shall we say. The fact that she, you know, she has... Well, I mean, I say the fact that she has a name, but actually quite a few of the other characters who are not important do have names. You have uh, Monsieur Dark, who's the uh, warden of the asylum. Monsieur Jean, I won't say his surname, um, but he is the uh, the potter. Um, you've got Clothilde, who's a fishmonger. Pere Robert, who's the local chaplain. Um, 
you've got uh, the village lasses don't have names. Do have Tom, Dick, and Stanley, but they had names in the original anyway. And then uh, Chapeau is the name of the coat rack. So there are characters who do have names, but um, Agath is uh, the one that you are going to want to remember. Um, she's played by Hattie Morahan. I don't think it's been in anything particularly huge, but hey, we're in the library and it looks bloody gorgeous. It does, but did Belle even visit a bookshop at the start of the film? Um, she visited the uh, little church, which had a very meagre selection of books, which the chaplain allowed her to borrow. So it's just like, yeah. But I suppose that does make sense, you know, in a town where they think reading is weird. It doesn't make much sense for them to have a bookshop there. I don't think it was set, like, the books would sell particularly well. Well, it doesn't really make sense to change it at all. Why not just keep it like that? Well, that is pretty much just the entire question of everything with this film, isn't it? <laughs> like, Belle loves books here, but all she had to read was a few of them. But now she has loads, so it's all good. And this is another change which I do actually quite appreciate. Of uh, Obviously, in the original, Beast is... He doesn't know how to read and write, because, you know, obviously he got transformed as a, as a child. Um, and then Belle decides to teach him how to read with Shakespeare, because that's a great place to start. Yeah. <laughs> um, whereas here, uh, he's actually very learned, and because he was transformed when he was older, and he's got that whole library, and so he's read most of the books in there, because what else is he going to do with this time? And so it creates a nice opportunity for Belle and Beast to bond, because you sort of see the similarities in their personality, more so than you did in the original, but it's then the thing of, I don't think that Emma Watson and um, Dan Stevens have quite the same chemistry as Pedro O'Hara and Robbie Benson did in the original. Not at all. I saw them like, well, he was in bed, she was tending to him, I didn't feel anything. Yeah. And it's just one of the things we just go, eh, it's not, not quite what I was, I was going for. But I... I like where they were going with it. It's just they didn't pull it off. And I think that is ultimately a lot of my frustrations is it's in execution. Like in concepts, there's not really any uh, terrible ideas here. It's just they're not executed as well as they should have been for something that is so beloved. I have to say, I'm thinking, I'm watching this, I'm just going, oh god, what am I going to be like when the Wicked film comes out? Oh no. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm I'm probably going to be so neurotic, it'll be unreal. Uh, we should have to do a uh, movie comma that, I think. Yeah. Like, all I can say is, please let it be good. Please let it be good. <laughs> there we go. Baby steps. Yeah. We use a spoon here, okay, when in Rome, I suppose. Yeah, and it's just like, you've made the effort, so I'll make the effort for, to make you feel more comfortable. Why not? Ah, oh, beautiful. We're tidying up, which is basically when Human Again would take place, but obviously doesn't. It has been banished from this film. <laughs> okay, she's evoking a little bit of Paige O'Hara here. No, not really. Maybe it's just the music. It's the music. Tricking my mind into it, you know? <laughs> It's like, guys, they are 
They're literally just there. They can hear you. <laughs> yes, we want him to hear us. That's the trick, you see. <laughs> Yeah, I heard you the first time, Cogsworth. Yes, Mrs. Potts, we heard Cogsworth the first time. We don't need to hear you repeat it as well. <laughs> okay, this is something that happened in the original as well. We're just taking the piss here. Yeah, because, of, of course, because <laughs> that's what we do. Even when we like things, we take the piss. Part of me wonders why they didn't go for, like, full prosthetics. Um, I think it's probably because that would make singing quite difficult. I guess, but it's been done before. You could do CGI during those points. I don't think I trust, um, production companies with uh, doing CGI singing. Hmm. Like... We've all seen Superman's non-moustache. Um, I, I don't think I would trust anybody to do lips on an, on anything if it's partially prosthetic, partially not. Don't think it would end well. So I suppose since you know we're in a rather quiet a bit of the film. Um, it's probably worthwhile to, you know, just go over the general critical response to the film, which was actually generally quite positive. Um, there's praise for its ensemble cast, its visual production values, its musical score, the songs, and faithfulness to the original film with a few elements of the Broadway musical version. Um, but then the design of the beasts and the servants in their object form received mixed reviews. Um, so I believe Metacritic's um, consensus, oh no, it's Rotten Tomatoes' consensus, is with an enchanting cast, beautifully crafted songs, and a painterly eye for detail, Beauty and the Beast offers a faithful yet fresh retelling that honours its beloved source material. I don't know whether I quite agree with that statement, but hey, we are getting something quite different here. Um, magical book that can take you to wherever you want to go to find out stuff. Huh? Um, yeah, this is basically to give Belle a bit of backstory about what happened to her mum. Because this is clearly a bit of the plot that needed to be here and totally isn't here to, you know, just pad out another ten minutes of film. All right, well, I'm receptive, let's see. I suppose I'd, I'll give the uh, the critical reception a, a break for the time being, because this is kind of, yeah, it's new plot stuff. Yeah, these drawings seem fresh. So are they actually in the past right now, or is this just a vision? I really don't... Well, so it's not It's not really in the past, um, I think, because it's all sort of a little bit dilapidated, so it sort of is now. Okay. Um, but obviously it's seeing where she was raised before they moved to where they are. The plague, I guess. Yeah, basically the plague killed Belle's mum. 
And so uh, Maurice left with Belle because she needed to keep her safe. Holy shit, that got dark for a moment. Well, hell, I'm mildly interested. I mean, Belle, you asked to come here. It's like, yeah, you kind of... You did kind of ask for that. And you kind of got the answers that you were looking for. Mm -hmm. So... Be careful what you wish for. It's an interesting wrinkle into the narrative, but it's just like... Was it... Necessary? This, however, is quite fun. Oh shit, yeah, now nah, this is good. Oh. Let's see, what will win out? His love of the truth or his love of Gaston? Well, I, th I think we all know the answer to that question. I don't know what he expected to happen there. He needed to move a little bit quicker. Yeah. It's just like, if you're going to slap someone, you've got to kind of element of surprise and just go... Uh, in the original, that tempo would have been fast enough to let him slap him. Well, I think he was slightly <laughs> too crazy in the original, so he didn't really uh, get much of a chance. Sorry, I was going for a better joke, though. It's <laughs> so, okay, I've hired Davy Jones' crew to kill you. Well, more to lock them, um, lock him up. Send him away to the crazy house. And uh, we are going into uh, the Beauty and the Beast scene. Neat. At least he's not like Charmander, because, you know, obviously... I was <laughs> thinking that throughout the entire movie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we're such geeks, aren't we? <laughs> no, I want to see Beast in all his finery, because I've honestly forgotten the promotional material for this. To be honest, I've quite forgotten it as well. <laughs> oh, that's a threat you should not ignore. You've got to listen to Mrs. Potts, otherwise you know it's going to end badly. <laughs> <laughs> it was not quite as like conveniently timed as the original, but I enjoy that. I think it, it was because in the original it was kind of stupid, but it didn't really make sense. Whereas here it's just like they've tried to doll him up like they would have done in the past. Yeah, and so it works. And I don't quite know how this works, but uh, it's trying to make the dress more magical. I don't think it quite succeeds, but there we go.
All right, I'll get some gold shavings in there, I suppose. I say beasts come out looking really dapper, but I'm I'm just really disappointed in that dress. I think the live action Cinderella has completely spoiled me on uh, live action versions of uh, Disney fairy tale dresses. <laughs> also, you may not have noticed it, but your brain did that. There was no big reveal scene. She just appeared. Yeah, there's no her coming down the stairs until they're together. But yeah, that's a shame. Oh, this is sounding nice. It's it's nice, but I, once again, I would prefer I know. Emma yeah. Thompson singing as Emma Thompson rather than this accent. Yeah, there's something a little bit too expected about this scene. Like, there's no real bite to it. Yeah, I I I, I get that. As well, it kind of it has that same uh, iconicness as the dress transformation in Cinderella. And while I would say that the live action one landed this, I feel this one sort of maybe doesn't necessarily land it quite so well. And I don't know whether it's there's perhaps too much simplicity. In terms of the camera work? I think they tried to make it more simple, yeah. Which is kind of ridiculous because, like, the original is a sort of masterpiece of animated cinematography. And, like, there's so much movement and it's really quite stunning. Whereas this, there's obviously a lot of choreography going on, but I'm just like, um, where's my big swooping shots going round and round and kind of like mm? Where, where's me kind of big amazing spectacular moment yeah it's just very static shots and then for some reason we get extra sparkles I don't know where these come from but still so are we going to get the pan up to the ceiling I I, I don't think so. Okay. Is this an adaptation or not? You're giving me mixed messages. Exactly. And that's the um that's the end of the ballroom scene. Wow. Yeah, it's not as good, is it? It's like a fan film at points. Yeah. And it's like you have all that budget. And all that potential. And you just don't land it. Because, I mean, I would say that ballroom scene would not have been a difficult one to get right. No, but the thing is, it was like kind of marked out for me from minute one where Belle just appears. There's no, like, sensuality to it at all. Well, they're just like two lovers meeting for the first time, really, or illicitly, even. Yeah, and also, there's, once again, I just return to that dress, it just looks really disappointing. It's just like, she's meant to be in this like really gorgeous, sumptuous ball gown, and it just sort of looks like it just sort of hangs there. It doesn't really pop at all, and you just kind of just like, um... The yeah, and then also it's that whole stuff with the camera work doesn't quite... I don't get any of the sort of grandeur of... Or grand romance of the moment. And it's just like, you've just completely fluffed it. Also, I have to say, and again, I'm trying not to be critical of Emma Watson's looks, because that's kind of shitty, but she doesn't look that different all dolled up than she did at the start of the film. No, she... <laughs> It really doesn't, but then, to be fair, I don't think Animated Belle looked too different, dolled up, to what she did originally. It was just a slightly different hairstyle and a fancier dress. 
but there we go. Oh, I know one thing that's going to get marked down here already. Do you know, Rip, something that was present in the original but isn't present here? The 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 the, the green smoke gas stuff. No, it was the uh, the owner of the asylum. No, I, I think he is present, but he's uh, clearly not present in the same manner as he was in the original. Because uh, yeah, that was like super creepy. Well, he was voiced by Tony J, and I imagine well, he was dead a long time by the time this movie was made. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But yes, we were about to get the Oscar bait song, Evermore, which I do think is very well done. But once again, I would have preferred If I Can't Love Her, because that's a really, really powerful song. Because Evermore is more kind of, I'll love her forevermore, even if she doesn't come back. Um, Whereas If I Can't Love Her is... Because it occurs earlier on in the story and then gets a reprise at this moment. Um, and it's sort of all about how he thinks that sort of nothing could actually help him. Like, no- nothing could teach him how he could have loved her and make her love him. And if he can't love her, then who? And sort of the last line is, if I can't love her, let the world be done with me. Mm. Which is sort of that whole just feeling abandoned and it's a really powerful and beautiful song and while Evermore is quite touching I don't think it quite reaches the heights of If I Can't Love Her Hmm, okay. Feeling it. It's a good song, and I mean, I think Dan Stevens does a very good job of it. Like, really good job. Especially, you know, with having to do sort of beast voice type thing. Mm, yeah, I like it. And it does build up quite nicely. I do wish that the cinematography was slightly less pedestrian for it, because this is sort of a song and a moment where you can do some pretty spectacular moments, whereas what he's basically doing is just climbing up and the camera doesn't really do much, but still. Dan Stevens does a great job here. Could have been a bit more energetic at the end there, I think. Yeah, it needed, like, kind of full-on belting into that. But I think, sort of, bit fancier camera work would have helped 
in terms of just lifting the mood of that sequence. That said, I have spent a lot of this film moaning about how the stuff is not as good as the original. Um, however, we're about to go into the one song that I would say is actually far superior to the original right now. Oh, okay. And that is the mob song. And part of that is because of the orchestra. Like, it's... Hearing it with this level of orchestra is just incredibly amazing. Yeah, so there's the Asylum um, owner. Certainly not as creepy as Tony Jay's, but still. Alas. Not quite as powerful as the original there. There was not even a speck of light coming off that mirror. No. And also, like, the whole thing was, like, show me the beast! <laughs> like, shoving up to everyone's face. It's because it's all sort of iced over and just, like, scratched, and you're just like, how is anybody actually able to see the face of the beast there in that? Yeah. <laughs> like, seriously, how can they see it? Especially from a distance. Bit more of a witchcraft bent in this story, I've noticed. Yeah, I think it works. I think it's also part of the reason why I do really like the mob song in this version more than the original. Ooh. Crossed the line there, I think. Yep. Oh, this was always one of my favourites. And I think it, it's it's really well done here. I mean, already the, the cinematography is more interesting than it has been throughout the film. And once again, just that orchestra is incredible. I think it it just furthers the point that I think they did Gaston and LeFou very well in this film. Yeah, Gaston and LeFou, the beast has grown on me. I'll go on that. I, as I said, Dan Stevens does the beast very well, and he's easily the strongest of the two leads. It's kind of sad because David Ogden Stairs was the original voice of Cogsworth is no longer with us either. I know. It sucks. Because David Ogden Stairs was an amazing voice actor. He was a Disney legend. I don't oh, think. Without a shadow of a doubt. Was he an official one? I'm not sure. Um, let me have a look. I mean, I would, I would bloody hope so because, like, seriously, if anybody deserved to be a Disney legend, it was him. Because he was also a Ratcliffe in Pocahontas and uh, Jumba in uh, Leon and Stitch. Oh, 
can't see anything on his Wikipedia page, but let's see. I like how the inside of this cell is padded. I know, it's a nice touch. Um, so it doesn't look like he was ever officially given Disney Legend status. Oh. However, he is without a doubt a Disney Legend, so really. H hang on, they actually went there? Uh, somehow, yes, that's something the book had the ability to do. I don't bloody know. Let me guess, it's a lockpick of some description? Uh, no, if I recall correctly, somebody helps them out. Okay. Obviously, it's not Chip, because Chip's at the castle right now. <laughs> yeah. It's not Chip coming in on a blooming invention, smashing things into the uh, into the side of the building. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. I know they are actually lockpicking it with her, uh, her hair grip. I mean, it makes sense, because obviously they're both inventive people. So it works that they uh, managed to break themselves out, but still... Oh, he's taking his natural stance on the parapets. Yep. There's a little bit less intenseness here than I'd like. Yeah, and it is going to get slightly cartoony in a minute. Which, I mean, the original sequence did anyway. Yes, yes it did. Very cartoony for a live act action adaptation. I have to say, LeFou had a very odd voice, and I think Josh Gad was probably the perfect recreation or actor they could have gotten to try and mimic that naturally without putting on a voice. Oh, definitely. Like, he worked out. He's a brilliant choice for this role. You ever been beat up by furniture, Richard? Not f furniture that's alive. Like, I have ended up getting slightly beaten up by furniture, you know, like, where you accidentally stub your toe. I bumped money on my desk the other morning as I got up, and it was just like, for God's sake. Um, but in terms of, you know, furniture being alive and attacking me because it wants to harm me, no, that's not happened. Oh, well, that's a betrayal in the making. Oh, yeah, yes, it is. Lock him in there, lock him in there. Come on. Damn it. We'll be going now. All right, well, one of us will anyway. Okay, and I guess that's him done for now. Pretty much, yes. Did he use the crossbow in the original Gaston, or was it like a proper rifle? I feel like it was a crossbow. Hmm. Although I know that he did have a a rifle or a gun of some description um, in the original, because he did use it, but still. Madame de Garderobe is about to uh, get her moment in the sun right now. Yeah, this is pretty much one for one with the original. Yes. Okay, well, maybe not one to one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that that's one of the uh, the little gay moments that they they twinkled in there. Could have used any word other than twinkle, mate. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see that it, it it was put intended. Okay, Jesus.
So LeFou is basically on the side of justice now. Basically, yes. And also we just got the revelation that one of those characters is in fact Mr. Potts. Okay, sorry. Took me, out, took me a moment for my brain to click into gear there. So her husband was away from the castle when it was enchanted? Yes, so he managed to escape before everything got taken over. Well, you, you might n might not want to do that because you'll need those later. <laughs> you might very well need those because we don't know what those um, are technically attributed to in your real form. You see, I told you you should pay attention to Agatha. She's kind of important. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty aware of who she is at this point, mate. Yeah, it, it, it's it's pretty obvious. It's the only other one with magical powers in the film. Why won't they put gargoyles in Kingdom Hearts, he whispers to himself? Because they're not doing any TV things, at least yet. Maybe Kingdom Hearts 4 then might acquiesce, we don't know, we'll see. Yeah, sure she did. How has she got up that castle really, really quickly? Yeah, man. Must have sprinted like a motherfucker up there. Oh, I'm starting to get the height shivers. Yes, it, it is a very good climax. I'd say that in the grand scheme of things, the end of Beauty and the Beast is much more successful than the rest of it. What, in terms of, like, just judging by the film itself rather than the original? I mean, also judging by the original, like, I'd say the rest, the original film manages to be consistently excellent, whereas I'd say that the live-action remake comes into something that could be called its own in sort of its final um, half an hour or so. Mm-hmm. Damn. Low blow, Gaston. Jesus. Well, I mean, it was more of a high blow because it came from on high, but still. <sighs> Richie, 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 we have 14 minutes left and I do not need your shit right now. <laughs> That doesn't really have as much as, like, the intense righteousness as the original, I think. Because, um, I like Luke Evans as Gaston, but he doesn't really have, like, the meanness streak of the Disney Gaston. No, he doesn't. Which is probably the one weakness in his portrayal of the guy. He's not as, like, overtly evil. But... He does pull off everything else really well, so I can forgive the lack of ultra villainy. But then also, to be fair, that was probably arguably a a flaw in the original film, because ultimately they, they turned him into a proper Disney villain, um, whereas he's much more complex and interesting if he is, as he is portrayed here, of being, you know, the the hot guy that everyone fancies who wants to uh, get the girl he wants and just the whole sexism argument. But yeah, he's brutal at the end there, just goes full murder on the beast. But he does get his comeuppance, though. Whee! Gah! 
Yahoo-wee! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the original Beast was like stabbed once. Here he was like shot three times. Yeah, so it does kind of make more sense that, you know, he is pretty much at death's door at this moment in time because, like, seriously, most people would be, you know, they've been stabbed in the back, shot multiple times, and uh, had, you know, also just generally weak because you've been stupidly close to being turned into a gargoyle or whatever. Oh yeah, I remember this part. This is where uh, Rapunzel cries on Eugene and brings him back to life. Exactly. Like It's, it's like you've seen this movie before, Tom. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Uh, that was a fun pillage. We're going home now. All the work is done. Like, seriously, let's just get on with it. Okay, this angle I do like. It's quite heartbreaking. Oh, no, that's heartbreaking. It's just cruel. That's pretty cool, gotta say. Definitely one of the better additions to the film, because it is actually a really heartbreaking sequence. You kind of go, oh, I hadn't been feeling emotions throughout most of this film, and then suddenly, oh, there they are, that's where the feels are. The good job the witch was there at that precise moment. Yeah, it's quite helpful. Alright, let's see how well they adapt this. No light coming out of his fingertips and foot tips. Zero out of ten. They, they, they didn't go full on Doctor Who regeneration on this one, unfortunately. Which is weird, because that's exactly what it reminds me of. It, yeah. <laughs> Change Change back! <laughs> <laughs> Really? You're not going to say anything? Okay, well. No, they've been waiting to snog like the entire film. Give them that, for God's <sighs> sake. It's her fault she's not a furry. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, I also do like that um, she doesn't sort of recoil and just go, who is this man? And then suddenly go, oh, it's you. 
before finally stopping in. This is quite cool. So yeah, this is what I was not quite fully remembering of certain elements of the castle were changed to be slightly more horrific, but it was always as ornate as presented. Oh. Really? Really. And he did actually lose most of his teeth, so uh, that worked out quite nicely. Oh, there we go. Is that their actual names, though? Because it's a bit weird <laughs> now that they're actually human again. A little bit, but um, that is basically their names, yeah. Sorry, residual magic. <laughs> Didn't he have like fifty brothers and sisters in the original? We ne we don't know. Yeah, exactly. we, we never find it out there. Out. So I don't know why I'm asking. Honestly, oh look, it's all the people who tried to storm the castle before. Fuck off, you ingrates! I know they've now all remembered the castle exists and that their uh, their loved ones were there. Which is a nice, it's a nice reunion. I and also, know, I know. I, I like how they now sort of answer the question of uh, is Chip actually Mrs. Potts' son? Yes, yes, he is. Um, in de aging Mrs. Potts from seemingly in her 80s to uh, about sort of 40s, 50s, it makes a lot more sense. Pip Pip, what the fuck are you doing in France, little English boy? This is quite a fun rendition of the song. We are about to get a slightly what the hell was that moment, but it's fine. We are also about to get, you know, the uh, the gay moment that a lot of people freaked out about um, and sort of nearly did get the film banned in certain countries. It's ridiculous that that was such a thing. Um, because it's such a minuscule moment. I'd say what is actually a bigger thing is the fact that you have two uh, happy interracial couples and it's perfectly normal and that's wonderful, which you would have thought would have been perhaps a slightly bigger thing for Hollywood movies, but still. <laughs> There's the roar. That's the bit where everyone goes, You really doing that? But it's fine. Also, not sure I'm a big fan of LeFou's moustache. Mm. <laughs> Don't think it suits him. <laughs> There's the gay moment. Was that, that's it? That's it. That's nothing. Exactly. <laughs> That's what everyone kicked up such a fuss about. What a bunch of babies. I know, it's ridiculous. No stained glass, zero out of ten. <laughs> okay, bit of a weird outro, but I'm nitpicking now. Okay, that was the live-action Beauty and the Beast from 2017. Richie, force. Disappointed is pretty much my general overview of this version of Beauty and Beast. Like, certain bits of concept I really appreciate. Some of the additions, like 
the all to do with the castle and the servants becoming more inanimate as time goes on. Ah. Love it. Um, yeah, that's really, great, actually, yeah. I really like the uh, addition of, well, turning Beast into more learned and um, that whole, the joint love of books, which actually ties Beast and Bell together. So you've got that contrast in types of men of Gaston's very much the uh, typical brute type. And you can see that Beast and Bell have a connection. And it works, um, but in general, musically, it's it's disappointing in comparison to the original and the Broadway version. Yeah, and um, that hmm. sucks. It is nice though that they brought um, Celine Dion back to sing over the credits. That's quite a nice touch. Oh, because um, cool. she sang the the Beauty and the Beast duet in the original, which is quite a nice one. So they brought her back to do um, Days of Summer, whatever the hell this song's called. Yeah, yeah. <sighs> but yeah, in general. I'm disappointed in this film, and I'm glad I didn't actually spend any money to see it. Wow, jeez. Um, don't think Emma Watson's good as Belle, particularly. I feel you could swap her out with anyone, and it would only improve the film. But uh, Belle's part was just great. I think uh, Luke Evans and Josh Gad are really good in their roles. Emma Thompson's good. Um, I don't know why he got Ian McKellen for Cogsworth, but he does a great job. Hello, yeah, sorry. <laughs> trying to call me out while I'm criticising him. Uh, Ewan McGregor's quite good. A lot of the songs are not at the correct tempo to energise the audience. I don't think they're too downplayed. Um, but, like, the set design was very nice. Oh, I, love yeah, the I, I love the concept of the castle itself becoming corrupted rather than it just falling into decay and they explicitly talking about how everyone forgot about the castle. Yeah, definitely. I think was a good narrative addition this time around because you're right, it didn't really make a lot of sense in the original. But um, it's the same way I feel about most remakes. It doesn't really need to exist and uh, especially not an Emma Watson led one. Sorry, not really a fan of her after Harry Potter, honestly, but um, yeah, not the biggest fan of the film. I want to say as I'm as disappointed as Richie because I can just go back and watch the original being the yeah. beach if I well, want to. I mean, yeah, I I would too, but I think I think what disappoints me is that there was potential here, particularly with some of the ideas and the concepts that were in there. It's just then in execution, just they just bolstered it up. Yeah, well. <sighs> That's the rub, I suppose. All right, guys, come back tomorrow when we have another Disney fun free come for y'all. See you then.